Thanks for uh, coming and joining us. Uh, Phil's from Main Sequence Ventures. Um, and, and I'm really excited about today's conversation because, because Phil's a, a very experienced um, venture capitalist, um, has this acronym of VC, and, and in the university sector, VC often gets <laughs> confused with, um, with vice chancellor. And, and they are equally important people, but for very, two very different reasons. So, so I really appreciate the time, Phil, of you coming and joining us. And, and really what I want to unpack today is, this, is, is uh, some of the experiences that Phil's had more recently in setting up the Main Sequence Ventures um, uh, VC fund, which is a, a CSIRO fund, um, really designed to, to, to back innovation, to really try and drive innovation out of the, in, into the Australian economy and globally. And Phil's going to be talking about one of the startups, which I'll, I'll let him introduce, but, um, but, but this, this very exciting startup opportunity. And, and there's really, in some senses, the other thing which I want to focus on today is, is really unpacking a, a new trend that we're seeing in entrepreneurship, which is really uh, almost moving away a little bit from, from a guy has an idea or a girl has an idea and they, they pitch it and someone gives them some money for that idea to this idea of, um, of actually building and curating opportunities, um, you know, using innovation and using venture funding um, and building a team. And so we're going to unpack that over the course of today. But, but, but Phil, um, you're a busy person, so I appreciate you having some time with us. But tell us a little bit about Main Sequence Ventures because it's, it's actually quite unique for Australia to have a, a venture fund like this. And, and tell us about where that, where that came from and where it is and maybe where it's heading and, and what, how you think it's different to other, other venture funds. Great. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks for having me. And um, uh, I'm just thinking a little bit about that, that name, Venture Capitalist, and, um, and how I always feel really uncomfortable with it because it's kind of like Gordon Gecko kind of writing a check and, you know, it's like being a banker. But, you know, increasingly, and I guess to the topic of, of this session, um, I see what I do more like being a kind of movie producer or a creator, like maybe I'm a venture producer or something like that. But the the art and science of making a new venture is sort of complex and it needs a lot of things, including, including capital. So ma Main Sequence Ventures is the CSIRO's Venture Capital Fund. We're a $240 million fund with the investment belief behind it that um, there is a great opportunity to back uh, companies that are solving the world's problems. You know, our, pl our planet's in trouble. We've got problems to solve. Um, and we need deep tech science driven companies to actually solve those problems that it's not the same as the first wave of companies where we could uh, build websites and we can digitize things. There are many, many layers to what we need to do to, to build these companies. Um, one, of, one of the areas that we're going to talk about a little bit today is our belief in the, the opportunities around food. And we have a theme in our fund called feeding 10 billion people. And the idea behind that theme is there is a strong investment case for solving the problem of how we're going to make twice as much food over the next two decades when there is no way we can use any more planet. So we can't use more water. We can't make more nitrogen flow. We can't emit more greenhouse gas emissions. We can't find more fields to put cows on. And so we need to find other ways of making food. And, uh, and the companies that do that are going to be industrial giants in the future. So the, you know, that, that, that's an example of the kind of companies we want to invest in. But, but making a food company is, is unbelievably hard. And, um, and I learned that in the early days. One of my early experiences here was, was helping the teams going through CSIRO's On Accelerator program, who were frequently from the food space. So um, I remember we had a company that had this brilliant technology around an alternate way of, of delivering calcium into the body. And the calcium came from um, shellfish um, and it was an opportunity to deliver calcium rich food to people. And the science was brilliant, but food has certain issues, which are, which are large. It has fickle consumers who are locked into habits of if you think about what you eat you know you kind of eat what you became comfortable eating when you grew up as uh, as a kid and what your mom and dad fed you so 
um, it's very hard to say, hey, you don't need milk anymore. Let's try this instead, for example. And this, this company, as an example, struggled with that. It had lots of missing elements. It didn't know how to think about the marketing. Um, it didn't know actually even what the product is. Should it be a, a lolly, a drink, a juice, uh, a supplement? Do they sell direct in supermarkets? Do they go... Uh, do they become an ingredients company for other food companies? There's so many questions and so many different paths it can go down. And, um, and some of those might be successful and some of those might be a catastrophe. So it's very, it's very, very complicated. So when we, when main sequence was, was formed, we, uh, we thought we needed to be very, directly involved with increasing the chance of success of these ideas. And in fact, we had we, even further, we thought we had to cause the creation of many of these companies. And, um, and one of the company, one of the, the, the themes that we were, that we were excited about was plant-based meat. If we've got to make twice as much meat, uh, but we can't because we haven't got <laughs> enough planet left. How do we do that? And of course, uh, there are we're, we're seeing the beginning of the answer to that question in companies like Impossible Food and beyond that we can actually make that thing we call meat with plants. And, uh, and there's a lot of science involved with that. So, uh, so the way we approach that is we thought, well, how do we, what are the elements that you need? So we need Obviously, we need uh, scientific capability, which is very, which is very deep. Uh, we need access to supply chain. We need to understand the customer and be able to get something in front of them very, very quickly. Um, and we need capital, obviously. Well, that part we can do. Uh, and, and we need some entrepreneurial firepower to kind of build the momentum into this and, and go hard. So we founded V2 Food that you may have heard of. And the name comes from the, you know, version two of the food system. Like literally the, the, the audacious goal of how do you actually just rethink where food comes from and what it, what it actually is starting with meat. And, um, and so we brought together the CSIRO who didn't have existing patents or anything like that, but they did have incredibly talented uh, meat scientists. There is such a thing as people who analyze meat and all the components of the flavor and the experience. And they do that normally for the meat industry. Uh, they, the protein science to actually transform the structure of a plant-based protein into something that's gristly and you know fibrous like like meat um and to bring that together with uh so we had csiro csiro have come on board to do that and they're a, they're a, they are a shareholder in the company and a very important part of 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 the business now doing everything from um lifetime carbon assessments of the products through to nutritional uplift work streams to um the you know refinement of the different textures so you can make pork and chicken and all these other things um we have hungry jacks uh you know the australian burger king who have really helped us with supply chain and straight you know we straight into um national launch um and uh, and main sequence coming together to actually fund it with an amazing entrepreneur who already knew how to make a new product from experience in companies like Mars and PepsiCo and his name's Nick Hazel. So we, we assembled all those ingredients together. And, um, and what that allowed us to do was, was launch a company that, that very quickly had lots of impact. And just to give you some kind of calibration of that, uh, Impossible Foods, who are really the gold standard from our perspective, the company to compete with. Um, and if anyone's had that, it's a remarkable product. Uh, they, they, they had already spent 500 million US dollars and had taken five years in the lab before the first customer in a restaurant got to taste their meat. Um, we created a product with all that firepower um, in nine months and launched it at Hungry Jack. So we took the time it takes to make a baby, <laughs> but our baby was a alternative meat company. 
and, uh, and we launched nationally across Hungry Jacks uh, in October, nine months after we had actually founded the company and started this machine in motion. And, you know, I think any of us involved in making ventures, which we all are, um, know that um, momentum is really important in making a company. And in fact, if, I, if, if there's one principle which, which I believe is so important and I really live by its momentum, um, the any time I've started a company where there has just been such velocity in progress, just sweeping away everybody, customers are just astounded by how quickly it's coming together. You know, the team's excited and thrilled and uh, the investors are going, oh my God, you got that done in that much time? Like that, it creates a, a very strong virtuous circle. So one of the things I'm always trying to design in, in, our, in our company creations is, is how, do we, how do we begin with that momentum um, and not allow it to be interrupted? And uh, so we have some projects at the moment in other areas where for one reason or another, COVID not <laughs> being one of them, um, we are we we have reason to believe we wouldn't be able to just go 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 once we press start. So we're just pausing a little bit on pressing start until later on in the year. Uh, but um, uh, when we start, we will we will be unstoppable because we think that's just such an important part of the um, of the equation. So. How am I going, Cameron? Am I, am I yeah, talking no, about that's, things here? There's, yeah. there's, there's, so much, there's so much in what you've said, which is really <laughs> helpful. And I, I guess one of the things, and I do want to talk a little bit more about V2 um, and, and the trajectory, but, but there's a couple of things I want to pull up on and, and you can comment on one or both of them, um, depending on how quickly you get distracted. But, but one of which is, is this idea of, of momentum. I thought that was really good. And, and, and we often talk about this in terms of, of commercialization and entrepreneurship is, is finding product market fit and um, and there's this, there's this theme out there that says, look, um, you know, when the dogs are eating the dog food, like you're onto something right. And, and there's this, always this challenge of, of how do you know before you get started, you know, um, yeah. and particularly in, in technology, you know, and, and, you know, you're working with CSIRO. Uh, we work a lot with the University of Queensland. And, and, and a lot of these things, you know, you, you don't know because you've got to build it first. Um, and that's why a lot of startups fail because you build it and then they don't come. You know, so, yeah. so talk to us a little bit about, you obviously came to this and in some senses, I, I'm, I'm hypothesizing that you're a little, bit, a little bit lucky because Beyond and Impossible had already done this. And so the market was there, the market was hot. You just had to join. So I'm, I'm sort of interested in your thoughts on, on being a fast follower um, yeah. versus being a trailblazer. Yeah, that's, that's a great perspective. And you're right, the, the, we had a lot of clues, right? And a lot of groundwork had been done by um, by impossible in particular uh, to have a global conversation that was interesting to people that kind of lay down groundwork for this kind of company being sexy and important and and so we could model a lot of what we wanted to do from that so we were we were undoubtedly a, a, a fast follower um, point number one there is fast is really important <laughs> so if you're going to be a fast follower in a market which is swelling very rapidly um you you can't be a slow follower because you'll be an also ran right and you know we're, we're very clear that in the next couple of years you know we want it to be impossible foods beyond meat and v2 food right as the as the names that you talk about when you're talking about the world leaders in this area so yeah so we, whilst we're following we've got to get where they are you know as instantaneously as we can the second thing that happens is that um because you do that you can you then become a trailblazer right because another thing i'm a big believer in is as soon as you roll up your sleeves and get into the mud with innovators trying to solve a problem for certain people, all these other problems start to appear in front of you, right? And some of them, if you're a founder, you know, your company may well solve, 
from an investor perspective, I see other companies that I need to start looking for or need to start building. So an example of that is our, we invested in a com company recently uh, called Nourish that make uh, animal lipids, animal fats uh, without the animals. And, um, and the reason we did that is because in building V2 food, we saw that there was a key problem, which was that not a key problem. Uh, we could see the next barrier to cross, right? You know, sort of prote alternate proteins are already, you know, incredibly amazing compared to what they were a few years ago when the sort of pea burgers on the on the on the shelf at, at Woolworths. Um, but there is a threshold, I and mean, if you think about um, crunching into some bacon, uh, pork belly melt in your mouth, um, wagyu, veins of wagyu fat that make the meat very moist, uh, the creamy experience of milk. You actually can't do that. that. That's not alternate protein. That's another technology, which is around the lipids, which carry the flavor and the mouthfeel. And so we, uh, we observed that in V2 and you wouldn't know that unless you're trying to make meat from scratch, right? You sort of, you see that inside. Um, and, and so we started looking out for companies that, uh, that actually do that. And we, we, it was, it we, we caused that company to happen and the work to begin. And we brought a team out of CSIRO to do it. Um, set the, the final point, Cameron, is that the, um, the, how do you know question, the, okay part of momentum is how do you know quick right and and then this is a really interesting contrast to um how research generally happens in my experience at least so uh, a, a scientific project or platform usually has the the the, the core driver is is curiosity and understanding and kind of unlocking you know, um, so for example, if you do, if you're doing, if you had a scientific project on uh, making plant-based meat, all these work streams would open up around, well, how do we match the nutrition? How do we match the experience? And, you know, what other, what, what different technologies can we do? And, you know, how can we, how can we make the fat and how can we make the, make the protein and flavor and, and, and it becomes this sort of big fat, not the point of a spear. It becomes like a big fat roll through time slowly, which theoretically at some point is incredibly powerful because it's got all these answers. But, you know, we know that quite often that doesn't happen. Things kind of just get stuck or run out of funding along the way. And, and so what we did was um, we're very clear at the beginning of V2 Food, even though our ambition... Um, uh, is and is definitely all, all starting to manifest now to be a, a company that is not only interchangeable with meat, but actually nutritionally superior. We're very clear that our first job was to make it nutritionally uh, on par with beef, no better. Like don't try and don't try and go crazy innovating there yet. Get it on par, but without fail, make it something so good that a meat eater will just go, oh my God, I, like I can't tell. And so, um, and so we set a high bar there. D doing that with Hungry Jacks is, you, know, you intuitively you might think, well, I mean, it's like a rebel whopper. That's not like a Neil Perry steak, you know, with a high bar of, um, of experience. But, but actually a, a burger in a, um, uh, in a, uh, a patty in a burger is, um it's 100 percent beef right there's no salt there's no pepper there's no garlic there's no uh tomato sauce or it's just it's 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 minced it's a mince patty and so you can't hide you can't hide simply right you know so you you if whereas if we're making uh, a ragu or a sang choy bao or a lasagna you know, you've got all these distractions in the flavor and the experience that you can mask a suboptimal carrier or medium. And, 
and so that that was a high bar and we so we had we had that frame and we had in our sights you know hungry jacks Parramatta, high vis you know truckies driving through just wanting a burger um with absolutely no care about anything other than right price tastes like a burger love it kind of thing and that was our first test so we said in the design of the company we said um in six months put a smaller quantity of product in patties um in burgers in a real hungry jacks that ordinary people taste and they're going to tell us it's like meat and if that doesn't happen we don't have proof and there's no point doing anything else so that was our that's that's how we did it and got to the confidence that we wanted quickly yeah yeah no, that's great and, and i think one of the things that you've you've, you've called out is is this idea of, of making sure you're solving the right problem. Um, you know, again, yeah. researchers, the, the challenge is they want to solve all the problems. They want to make 100% productivity gains. They want to talk about nutrition and or they want to talk about, you know, 100% success. Um, and in reality, that's that's probably why we have this problem of, of a, a poor lack of, of commercialization because, because the researchers are solving lots of different problems, but not necessarily the single problem. So you focusing on that idea is that it's just got to taste just as good, if not better, um, and be equivalent in price and equivalent in nutrition. So, so that focus on that solving the right problem, I think, is really critical. And, and, and I guess one thing that you know, in the, in the courses that I teach in the um, in the UQ MBA and the Entrepreneurship and, and Innovation Masters, we're often trying to get students working with researchers to help them because what I see is this real opportunity. And and this is where I want to go to in the conversation is is how can we leapfrog? Because I mean, we're in this crisis, we're in this COVID crisis, and and the world's going to change. But, and that's going to, you know, that's going to open up enormous new opportunities, you know, for us as a country, because the whole of people that are going to collapse and the whole of new markets, new opportunities. Um, I see there's a real opportunity to actually partner with innovation, partner with scientists. Um, but, but what you've done is, is something different. Rather than trying to turn a scientist into an entrepreneur, you've found the right science. You've actually curated this, this opportunity. You've brought in the CEO, you know, you've brought in the entrepreneur, you've brought in the science, you've brought in the money. Um, for me, I actually think this is quite profound in terms of, of how this we could use this to propel us as a country forward. Um, yeah. Talk to us a little about this idea of, of, of venture science and, and about where you think this is going to go. Yeah. Um, so the, this has been an interesting journey for me because I began with this idea of sort of transforming entrepreneur, transforming scientists into entrepreneurs, right? And and there is no doubt that, that some of the best entrepreneurs I know are also quantum physicists and food scientists and, uh, you know, so very clever people, you know, right across different skill sets. But just like, just like all people, um, uh, some scientists are great entrepreneurs and want to be an entrepreneur and some don't and aren't. And, um, and so, that doesn't mean don't do these projects. It's still the key question. Do you have, do you have the scientific keeper of the flame in the company and the way forward? Do you have the entrepreneur and the commercial approach? You know, do you have the ability to tell a story? Do you have access to supply chain? All those things. I mean, every company will have different requirements. So that's sort of step number one is sort of what, well, what does this need? And, you know, as a hypothesis and who, who, who might we bring in to do that? Um, we're, we're, we're working on a project right now, which um, has got quite a few people involved actually. And, um, and, and it's really interesting as an investor, because you know, as you know, usually what an investor is doing is trying to maximize their holding. I mean, that's what we do. We sort of own a piece of, of an asset of a company and we try and make that, piece as valuable as we can and we want to own as much of it as we can whilst keeping everyone aligned inside the company and so this, here's the situation <laughs> because we need other people right this 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 thing that we're looking at right now will simply not succeed or take 10 years longer unless you just put inside the company the right people the right forces um, on the first day. So that's the idea of venture science. And the, and the, the second observation that sort of came along was that um, frequently 
you know, scientists, uh, that there's a dependency on a work stream already happened inside a research a university or CSIRO or something. Then there's been a whole bunch of work on it over the last five years, say, and there's been maybe millions of dollars put into it. And it creates all this inertia, right? Which is, well, you know, been lots of money put into this that we need to get returned. Um, you know, this is, maybe we shouldn't give it to you. Maybe we should give it to somebody else. And just all these conversations that stop innovation leaving a research organization. And, on, and, and, and the other side of this same opportunity is that uh, research organizations need revenue. They need, they, need to, they need revenue from doing research and they need excuses to do the most interesting science right? <laughs> that's funded. Um, so one of the ideas behind venture science was, well, what if we cause science to happen? What if, what if the venture, instead of waiting around ready to write the check with something that's already perfectly baked, says, why don't you guys get really, really good at making plant-based meat or you know, whatever it's going to be? And, um, and, you know, our company can have a research agreement with you and let's do this together and, you know, make you lots of money and cause this science to happen inside your organization. Um, and give us whole new insights about this whole new market that's that's happening. And it's been it's been profound, quite honestly. It's been it's been um, uh, it there's there's been no blockers, right? Anyone that no, anyone that's tried to take some IP, say, out of a university and start a company, I know you have. Uh, well, no, it's like pulling teeth. Right. Yeah. And, um, and it's very, very difficult. And quite often what happens is you chip away at the opportunity until there's kind of this crappy <laughs> sort of compromise left with everyone hating each other and not want, not, not wanting to work together. Whereas this is the opposite. This was like, fantastic. We can make, we can, make, we can get into this field, which I can see is happening. And we've definitely got all the skills to do that. And then as a result of that, millions of dollars have gone into CSIRO and they have a stake in a company which is becoming very valuable right now. And it's been so successful, in fact, in CSIRO that there's now a whole division that that's what they do. It's called, it's, it's called there's a director of company creation inside CSIRO. His job is to go around the whole organization looking for these opportunities to create a company from scratch and very rather than, you know, incubate the science for five years and then try and raise money on something, actually just cause science to happen from the venture opportunity. Yeah. And, and where I think that's really exciting is, 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 you know, through the MBA program, often we get people that are, you know, got 10, 15, 20, 30 years worth of experience. And they, they're interested in maybe a change of direction or they've come near the, the latter part of their career and thinking, I really have love to have a crack at something, but I don't have an idea. And so for yeah. me, this is really interesting where we, where we combine this power, which is what you've done with Nick uh, in B2Foods, someone who's got really deep domain experience, really good experience, really good credibility, but yeah. himself doesn't have that idea and actually bringing that person in and partnering them with some amazing scientists that can actually go out and, and create some value. So uh, mm. do, you, do you get a feeling that this is going to be, this could be something that, that, that catches on, you know, in terms of... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, this is... This is um... First of all, we need it, right? Because as I said at the beginning, I think that the next generation of massive companies need both incredible business talent and deep scientific knowledge, right? And, and we need to figure out what those companies are. We need to cause them to happen very, very quickly. They simply don't exist yet. And, um, and there's just this amazing opportunity. I, have, I often refer to the 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 world of of the universities and and CSIRO and the other research organisations as as a cookie jar because that's how that's what it is for me it's kind of like it's just like oh my god look at these cookies these are just this is just so delicious and and the 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 amazing opportunity for all the people on your course is is you you have this context of the university right now. And in other parts of that university, there is some incredible work going on. So actually, if you, if you imagine 
you know, you say to yourself, how can I, I'm interested in sequestering carbon. I want to find something that does that in an interesting way and find a commercial opportunity because I think the world's going to, is going to be pulling for that. I bet you, you could go around, <laughs> you could say to the one person in UQ, who should I speak to about this? And that will lead to another 10 and then that will lead to a, discussions with other people and before you know it you're already on to a business thesis about how you can actually solve that problem with the company and you can start the venture creation process yourself so it's an amazing opportunity and it's a it's incredible how people don't do that enough yeah and, and i think what's interesting is is um is in some senses this is how venture capital got started with is you know really wealthy people walking down the, the hallways of, of mit you know, stumbling across a scientist who's got this really cool invention saying, look, if we give you some money, can you build it? Um, and, and, and I think that's, that's really the genesis. So it's interesting to see that we've actually almost come full circle. I was at Imperial College in London not long ago and they say, look, people don't study business at Imperial College because we're the best business school. They study it because we're one of the best scientific-based institutions in the world um, and they want to yeah. get access to and close to, you know, technologies that are disrupting technology. So, so I, I think this is interesting. We finally come around to this point um, uh, which is which is fantastic, and I do hope that this um, that this actually is a trend. Um, mm. I'm just going to sorry um, while you do that, I'm just going to share my screen because I've got a, um, a message from our sponsors. Um, <laughs> so um, so so obviously this is a course that um, that has uh, that, that the course that I teach in the MBA program um, is uh, is the entrepreneurship innovation. We've also launched fairly recently this Masters of Leadership in Service Innovation which is really trying to give people the skills, whether you're in corporates or whether you're, you're actually trying to change direction around the whole new, tr new trend in service innovation, you know, whether it's around AI and machine learning, we know that, you know, services are software and, and technology is going to be a real, a real disruptor. Um, and, uh, and the other thing which we're doing is, is we're making some of our online, um, massively open online courses available at just $8 each. And so if any of you out there that are watching are interested in, in just finding a little bit more about design thinking or about um, you know the tourism tourism industry, some of these courses that uh, and a number of these courses come from our um, our micro masters in corporate innovation. Um, and so the stuff we're talking about, you know, you and I feel is is relevant. And maybe just finishing off on this comment, relevant um, not only for an entrepreneur but also for a corporate. And I think those corporates that are going to survive are going to have to find ways to be innovative and and maybe talk to us a little bit about the impact that B two Foods has had on um, on Hungry Jacks uh, as a company. Sorry, Cameron, I was muted. Um, the, um, I think that service design course looks fabulous, by the way. I think that's another big underrated area because that unlocks so many, so many things. But the, um, yeah, the, 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 the engagement with a company is, you know, can be the most valuable thing ever. And it also can be rubbish. And, um, and, what it's all about is the difference between um, how the company behaves and whether they sort of truly lean into an opportunity. So with, we could not have done V2 food without Hungry Jacks. And because we had Hungry Jacks, we had a product that was ready for consumers that they understood terrifically. We could nationally launch. We already had supply chain to pretty much anywhere in the world. We already had co-manufacturing deals. So just all this happened incredibly quickly. So the, the understanding and the access to resources was just simply impossible to do without that kind of company. What is inspiring about how they did this process was they considered themselves as, as founders of that company, not they did. There was no confusion that this was a uh, another Hungry Jack's burger, right? It, it is, but that isn't. That wasn't their most. We 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 asked the question multiple times when we started the company. Um, do you do you want just another burger, like what became the Rebel Whopper, or do you want to make a company that's bigger than Hungry Jack's? Uh, we want to do the second one. <laughs> Uh, but if you want to just go and pay CSRO to do some work and have another product, then yeah, that that's cool as well. But sort of choose, you've got to choose. It's not, and there was great clarity on that, which we got from obviously the highest uh, authority in Jack Cowan. And 
Um, and, and it was even very specifically said, uh, this company needs to be able to sell burgers to McDonald's. Is that cool <laughs> kind of thing? And the answer is yes, right? And so that's quite a different approach. The second thing is what we, the way as we're structuring new ones of these, we've realized that the venture coming together with big companies who are a lot more sophisticated now, I think, than how they were before, thinking about new things and what their expectations are. And these research labs um, is that the, um, the usually when you go, let's say, let's say you had an idea, you, you know, you have a drink company and let's say you went to Coke and you said, I would like to co-develop this business with you. You know, let's, there's two things that normally happen. One is they go, well, you're just a gnat and I'm an elephant and you're kind of, I'm just not really noticing you. And, and they say, look, there's all this risk. And I know you just want, you just want me to fund you, <laughs> right? You're just another one of the people that's asking us for funding and really would rather just give you more money in five years when you've already nailed it. And then we'll just make it bigger. Right. Um, the interesting thing about venture science is you say to them, I actually don't want your money. I want you to work hard. <laughs> right. I want, I want you as the first step, so we, our job is risk as venture capitalists and entrepreneurs. And so we'll do that first bit, but what we need to be successful is your understanding and your access to the market and supply chain and so forth. So, um, so you'll get, so, so, so hungry Jack's got their shares for work, not for money at the beginning. Yeah, right. Um, and then subsequently invested when they had the confidence that a company needs, right, to take the appropriate kind of risk for a company. And that, that just, that worked brilliantly well. We got what we wanted as venture because we were, we were then, you know, thrown into, into momentum. Um, but they got the risk removed before they, you know, started investing shareholder money. Yeah. And I, and I think that's, that's really fascinating because, because we know big, co big companies don't do innovation because of the risk. And so you've sort of taken that risk off the table, but you've utilized what they have, which is customers and yep. systems and process. So you didn't have to go and build a new burger chain for your new you know, um, plant-based burger. You were able to just plug it into an existing ecosystem, which is the best of both worlds. It's sort of like a license and a startup all in one, um, yep. which, is, which is brilliant. So um, yep. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, Phil, just I've had one question from one on someone in the audience talking about, do you think there's an opportunity for say independent labs, you know, to set up or to get established outside of the SIRO and the universities? Do you think that's going to be something that happens where people, you know, start to do this together, re sort of abandoning the, the, the restrictions within big corporate research organizations? Do you think that's going to happen or is there an opportunity for that? Uh, oh, there certainly is. I mean, um, what comes immediately to mind is an organization in San Francisco called Indie Bio. Um, I don't know if the audience are familiar with that organization, but basically they're an, they're an accelerator. Um, but the accelerator has been set up around a synthetic biology lab. So they've got this kind of ragtag lab in, in, in a grotty part of San Francisco. Uh, but it's got all the, automation and all the ferment, you know, small scale fermentation and things like that. So you can actually start new food companies, new pharma companies, new ways of making dyes, new ways of making materials. Um, and that's a, that is a multi-billion dollar, you know, value entity now. And it's like, you know, I don't know how many years old, no more than 10. And, um, and so, I think there's, I think there's a huge opportunity, especially around very specialist things. So around food or around synthetic biology or around agriculture, there's a big opportunity there, um, to, to get involved. Usually the issue is just cost really, because they can, the, the great thing about working with UQ or CSIRO is you're walking straight into, you know, multi tens or hundreds of millions of dollars worth of, resources. And if, if anything, the tragedy is that they're, they're too often, you know, left untouched. And if, I think if, and, and the th what I'm really excited about is actually bringing 
those two worlds together. I think by having, you know, your group, just being close to people that are mixing things in test tubes and do, you know, doing things with photonics or quantum computers or whatever, will just cause great things to happen, right? Yeah. So um, there's loads of opportunity. It's completely, un, completely untapped. Yeah, that's awesome. Look, um, Phil, that's been a great conversation, and, and, and I'm 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 really excited about 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 what you're doing because I think it is a whole new paradigm change for um for how we're going to commercialize and how we're going to create new value for this country. And and, uh, and so, look, I, I appreciate your time. It's you've been very generous. Uh, for those of you that are watching um, or listening, um, you know, UQ has got a whole range of programs, whether it's the MBA program, Masters of Corporate Innovation, or the the Masters of Service Level Service Level Innovation. Um, you know, happy to, to uh, log on our website and have a look at some of those courses. Um, collectively, what we're really trying to do is to partner with great models and great tools, um, with great business models and innovation thinking, with actually great science, and, and try and see how we can create that, a future um, very similar to what Syro are trying to do. So, so Phil, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate you um, coming and speaking to us, and uh, look forward to catching up again soon and hearing about some of the new, um, new, uh, new synthetic biology sort of food startups that you're working mm -hmm. on. So, um, there's so some really good stuff going on. All right. Thanks for having me, Cameron and everybody. Thanks.